Father God, we come to you today wholly dependent upon you and rest in the truths that are found in Lamentations 3, 22 to 24. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Before I get started, I want to sort of take off on the series title of Six Hours Before, something that we've been stressing in our last few Sundays together is that in five chapters out of the book of John, uh, some 18 or so percent of the book, Jesus spoke, and it was only six hours of time. So the things that he said in that condensed time period, six hours, were crucial. And time was of the essence. He was days away from being crucified. <clears throat> and so I want to share with you today some time is of the essence things with regard to the body here locally, the body here in this church and a little bit, dis a little bit uh, more distant from this church but still connected. This past week, um, we had three deaths. Um, Psalm 116.15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And so on Wednesday... Uh, John Gates, a dear, dear brother, dear friend, uh, passed away uh, at age 51. He was um, waiting on heart and kidney transplants, and some might say that he ran out of time and his body gave out. More on that in a second. But dear John passed away. Um, Tina Rollins, who's here with us, I, I just told her, I've told her, and I don't put qualifications on it, I said, you, you're his mom. Um, she just uh, basically adopted John. He has little family, and um, so we miss John. And then Friday evening, I believe a little before 7 p.m., a dear sister in the faith, uh, Helen Tyler, who used to be a member of this church, um, passed away. She had um, had a heart attack uh, over the weekend before, and they made the, Michael, her husband of almost 62 years, made the difficult decision to remove life support. And then an hour later, um, Neil Beasley passed away. And I thought I would do better in second service than I did in first service. So uh, that family had been so generous and gracious to me and the, the boys, two of whom are older than me, but I still call them the boys, had been willing to let me adopt Neil and DeLois as my parents after mine are gone. And uh, so Neil contracted an infection and uh, about 10 days ago and um, passed away yesterday evening. <clears throat> So six hours before, just let that kind of lodge in for a second. This is what Jesus said when time was short. When time was of the essence, right? When it really mattered. And so I want to share a few things before we get into our text in the Gospel of John from, from other parts of Scripture. It says in Psalm 139, verse 16... Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So I said I'd come back to the whole he ran out of time comment. John was right on time, according to God's sovereign plan. Neil was right on time. Helen was right on time. 
because there are days when as yet one had occurred were already written in the book. And I believe that God is that sovereign <laughs> and that in charge. Now, how should we live in light of the fact that time is short? James 4, 13 through 17 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Now, I think that was written probably to everybody, whether in the faith or out of the faith, but certainly has a ring of being written with a primary focus toward those who are in the faith, that is, those who have trusted Jesus as Savior, to say, what's your perspective? What should it be like? There's another passage in Scripture that I think primarily is focused on those who have yet to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And it's found in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. And it says, Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared whose will they be so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God and so I want to just front end this and I'll come back to this near the end of my time speaking today as well but I'm so delighted that every one of you is here, and my, my suspicion is there are some of you who are here who have come, and I think God's in charge of you being here today, who, who have not yet trusted Jesus as Savior, have not placed all the weight on Him, and not your own merit or your own work, but on His completed work of dying and rising again to save you for eternity. And seriously, I think Scripture is real clear about this, right? Our lives are mists. And I'm super boastful and proud and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But did you notice what James said? If the Lord wills, the first thing he said is we'll live. <laughs> and then do this or that. Or perhaps to the one who has yet to trust Jesus as Savior, my trust is in my stuff, my plans, the path I'm carving out for myself. But that can't answer to the question of your soul is required of you tonight. Only Jesus has provided the answer to that question. In me, says Jesus, you will live. And so I started in the Psalms 116.15 and 139, and I want to end in the Psalms here, in Psalm 90, verse 12, that says, So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. I know this week, you don't usually have a week with three deaths in it. I had the privilege of um, 
making some of my visits this past week with people alongside me. And, and they, they asked me a question as though I was different than them. They said, how do you do this? Because it's hard, right? And my answer was, same way you do, God gives you the strength, right? And, you know, today I'm going to go home and stare at the wall and cry at some point. I can promise you that. But here's the deal. I have hope in Jesus Christ. Do you have hope in Jesus Christ today? I want to urge you to trust Jesus. The beauty of trusting in him is that it's not transactional like, okay, got my stamp, I'm ready to go to heaven. Yes, it is faith alone, by, by grace through faith alone. But he keeps on carrying us through until the end. It's a day-by-day -day cling. It's a day-by-day -day desperate dependence. And I want to lift up these three precious families right now uh, as they're more close to it than any of us and are navigating it and I just uh, pray for them I want to lift them up before I get started let's pray father I really want to commit to the families of John Gates and Helen Tyler and uh, Neil Beasley to you I want to lift up John's aunt and I believe he has a sister, and certainly Tina Rollins, his mom. <laughs> I pray for them that they would be carried along by your strength. Lord, I pray for Michael, Tyler, and their son Mark, and his wife Colleen, and their kids, Sean and Jude, that you would meet them right now in the loss of their dear Helen. And I lift up the Beasleys who, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, they're showing the way to all of us what this should look like. And uh, at the front of that is DeLois. I praise God for her, just lift her up as she's recovering herself from her own setback physically. And I pray for Mark and Diana, Mike and Mary Jo, Ashley and Mindy, their kids, and some of them have kids, so it goes down to great grandkids as far as Neil and DeLois are concerned. And I just lift them up as well. As they wait on you, Lord, they will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. And that they will find hope in their grief because you've given us hope in Jesus. So Father, as we turn to this great passage that is so tuned to this very hour, I pray that you would uh, work in our hearts that the, the very spirit of God that we will speak of, whom we, whom we will speak of, will, will enliven us and teach us and guide us in the truth and empower us to walk in the truth. We pray this for your glory in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I've already said I don't think there's any coincidences, and lo and behold, uh, these are the three next steps on your connection card. Go ahead and grab your connection card now so you can start getting warmed up for the fact that we're going to um, drop those in the, in the baskets or push send on our devices at the end of the sermon to share them because we pray for those things, and I want to be able to lift every one of your names up tomorrow as we pray uh, for these next steps. But these are the next steps 
um, <clears throat> in real, and, and I call it applying this sermon in real time because I'm just processing all this right at the same time with you. I figured something like this happens in the life of a body. We just need to process some together. And so in God's sovereignty, he gave us this marvelous roadmap for processing. I think I'm gonna start using this with friends and dear ones as I go into the scene of loss in the future. These are great, three great things that come out of this text. First, keep going in the faith by God's power. Secondly, respond to the work of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, glorify God by walking in his truth. Isn't that good? I didn't make it up and we were already planning on preaching John 15, 16 today, and here these, here these points are that I turned in before any of the three passed away, and as I've meditated on them, I've thought, these are the points. <laughs> Keep going in the faith by God's power, even in the face of pain, in the face of loss, the face of trouble. Respond to the work of the Holy Spirit. He speaks. He does. We'll talk about that in a bit, and then glorify God by walking in his truth. <clears throat> Let me give us the context where we will be. We're gonna be starting near the end of John 15 here in a few minutes uh, in our passage, but I wanted to give you context for this so-called upper room discourse, which is John 13 through 17. And just to give you your bearings, John 13 has sort of a prelude act where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples that we've examined a few weeks back. Then he begins his discourse after that, and he starts giving them a lot of loving truth, including hard stuff that they have to hear and be prepared for. And then it ends in John 17 with a prayer to his Father, God the Father, for his disciples and for us who follow uh, after them. <clears throat> but the near-term context in the upper room discourse is trouble. Why do I say that? Because look what Jesus says first after he finishes washing their feet. One of you will betray me in John 13, 18 through 30. And then he says, I'm going to depart. Now he doesn't overtly say I'm going to die, but he has said that in other places. So he's about to, he says though, I'm going to leave you in John 13, 33. In John 13, 38, Peter, before that, is, is zealous to follow Jesus, no matter what, wherever, it go, wherever you go, etc. And he says, oh yeah, before the rooster crows, you're gonna deny me three times, John 13, 38. Over in chapter 14, we learn that Satan's activity will indeed increase. He said, the prince of this world is coming. I think that's probably an allusion to the fact that Way back in Genesis 3, it says God speaking to Adam and Eve in the, in the judgment for, on their sin says the serpent will bruise the offspring of the woman on his heel, which I believe is a prophecy toward the, the crucifixion. So Satan's going to strike a blow. Sin will strike a blow in that sin has to be paid for. And... Jesus will be crucified. But we know from Genesis 3, and we know from other places throughout Scripture that Jesus will crush Satan on the head with a death blow, a finishing blow. But Satan in the near term will certainly be on the rise. There will be hatred and persecution in the world for these disciples because, oh well, you followed me and the world hated me and the world persecuted me, so that's what comes with following me. They're gonna hate you, they're gonna persecute you, Jesus says in John 15. And while we're speaking of John 15, I want you to know we will come back to John 15 in a future week. Uh, that's a marvelous passage about abiding in Christ at the first of John 15. Don't despair, we haven't skipped it, we're just coming back to it later. <clears throat> And then in John 16, two and three, he says, you'll be put out of the synagogues. And ultimately, P 
people will kill you and do it in the name of Jesus or in the name of God as though they're doing service to God. And then in John, in John 16, 20 through 22, he acknowledges that there will be a season near term of weeping and lamenting, which is what they were beginning, what was beginning to settle in on them in our, chap, in our passage today. And he says, and at the end, when I'm going to the cross, you'll scatter to your own places and basically leave me to die alone, save John the Apostle who wrote the book. He'd be there, but the other 10, Judas, of course, will have left by then and, and come to his demise, but John will be the one disciple there at the cross. Near-term context is trouble. I see the word death on the second bullet. I see the word killed, two bullets, three bullets from the bottom. It says in Scripture, Genesis 3, in the judgment that death is coming in, and Romans 5 talks about with the first Adam comes sin, and in, with sin comes death. And then 1 Corinthians 15 talks about through, through the first Adam, sin comes, and with sin comes death. And I believe certainly we're talking about spiritual death in those cases, but I also believe we're talking about physical death. Part of the stain and curse of sin is that physical death has come. And we lose people like three in a week, don't we? And so as we process today together in our collective path of struggle, as well as whatever your path forward looks like. Again, we get a chance to get a jump start on it today and apply it in real time in this sermon. And then going forward, I wanna encourage you to tuck these away somewhere where you can get to them and meditate on them and walk in them. Keep going in faith by God's power, not yours. Respond to the work of the Spirit as he speaks and glorify God by walking in his truth. <clears throat> so let's jump in to our passage in John chapter 15. Uh, and we're gonna talk there in John 15, 26 about the spirit, the spirit of God. And in John 14 through 16, we see some of the most condensed and precious teaching about the Holy Spirit in all of Scripture. What I'm going to share with you today in the next few minutes is not everything the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit. It's a lot of it, but not all. I, I encourage you to dig deeper and, and find what the Word of God has to say about the Spirit. But Jesus, of all the things he could have said in the six hours he had with them before he was arrested to go to the cross, he chose to speak a lot about the coming Spirit of God. The first illusion of five happens in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus speaking says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. What does this say very quickly? If I were to put a header over this particular first allusion to the Holy Spirit, I'd put the word helper above it. I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper. More on that word here in a few minutes. What's the helper do? He's gonna be with you forever. What a comfort, what an what a encouragement. And who is he? He's the spirit of truth. You can Take to the bank the fact that he speaks truth. He acts in truth. He doesn't speak in falsehood. In a world today when everything swirls around, where we're grasping for what is true, we can be sure that the Spirit gives us truth. He is the, indeed the Spirit of truth. Now, crucially, the world cannot receive this Spirit. Oftentimes in Scripture, the world is the world who is in need of saving, in need of a savior. I think that's probably the case here. The world, those who have not trusted Jesus as savior, cannot receive this spirit. 
because it neither sees him nor knows him. I think that's really the best proof of why this is alluding to people who have not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior because they don't even know him. They can't see him because the Spirit, the Father, and the Son are one. You know him, says Jesus, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is a mind blower to me, but it's crazy encouraging. Jesus is standing there in the flesh with his disciples in this crucial hour, and he says, you know him because he dwells with you. Why would he say he dwells with you? Because the Spirit and the Father and the Son are one. And who's with him right there? Jesus is speaking. And if Jesus is speaking, he said once before, or more than once before, if you see me, you see the Father. I and the Father are one. Where does the Son come from? He proceeds from the Father. Flows out of the Father. Three distinct persons of the, of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Spirit. So Jesus is saying, you know the Spirit. But even more revolutionarily, he says, and he will be in you. In you. He will indwell you. That's crazy. That's incredible. It's awesome. That's the first allusion to the Spirit. The second comes just a few verses later in John 14, 25, and 26. Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. And there's this constant interplay Jesus is saying about, I'm saying stuff to you now, but here's what's coming. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The big word I'd put on top of this second saying or this second allusion is teacher. It says Jesus is going to send the Spirit. It says here the Father will send the Spirit in Jesus' name. So the Father and the Son send the Spirit along. And he's going to teach those who are in Christ all things and bring to their remembrance, our remembrance, all that Jesus has said one of his great ministries as teacher. And then there's three more allusions to the Spirit, all three of which, bonus, are in our passage today that we're about to jump into, which is John 15, 26, John 16, 7 through 11, and John 16, 12 through 15. So let's quickly mo- work our way through this passage. Beginning in John 15, 26, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. What does that say? Let me mark the things that jump out at us from this passage. First, there is that word again, he's the helper. I remember this gave me a good warm memory as I was preparing for this sermon. Uh, My dad, who was a pastor for for decades, uh, I remember he preached a series in Dallas, and I'm sure we uh, pronounced the Greek with Texan inflection. Um, but he, call, he talked uh, over and over till it was drilled in our heads about the paraclete. The paraclete. And the paraclete, the spirit, the helper, is the one who comes alongside. That's kind of what the word means, the alongsider. Now he dwells in us, but he also, have you ever had that friend who comes alongside you just at the right time with just the right resources? They don't come along often, but when they do, it's a balm, isn't it? It is a comfort. It is a sustainer. The helper comes. And tied up in that word help is guidance, is comfort, is teaching, all these things. He's going to come. He's going to help. And the next thing is, Jesus sends him from the Father and he proceeds from the Father. I've already mentioned the proceed word has something to do with kind of flowing out of. That's the best kind of word picture for that. Flows out of the Father. He proceeds from the Father and the Father sends him along. Now, I don't want you to think that we've divided the Father out and we lost some of the Father and now here's the Spirit over here. They're complete in and of themselves each person of the Godhead. And who is this spirit again? The spirit of truth. 
the spirit of truth. Again, I think I've, I've made my case earlier that in a world where truth is highly prized and truth has become very situational and very individualistic, this isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the truth of God, the truth of his word. This is the spirit of truth. And what does he do? Well, first, he does it. He is personal. As I've said, he is a person of the Godhead. He's not a force. He's not impersonal. He's not some aura. He's not some, you know, indefinable, you know, force field out there. He's not a feeling. He is God, the Spirit of God. And he is personal. And I think that's encouraging to us as we understand his ministry that it is a personal ministry. And he bears witness about Jesus. I, for some reason, I'm on a little bit of a J. Vernon McGee kick in my studies. Um, he's not a primary resource for me, but he, his quotes keep popping up in my study of the book of John. And I heard him telling a story, or I read about him telling a story about a guy who said, we're gonna have a Holy Ghost revival meeting. And the friend proceeded to talk about how much the focus was going to be on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit this, the Holy Spirit that. It's all about the Spirit. And this is actually instructive for us because I think in our conversations, and even in this city for sure, we have conversations about the Spirit a bunch. And what McGee noted in his friend's analysis that it's all going to be about the spirit as he said that's not the spirit i know because the spirit i know isn't concerned with drawing attention to himself he's about jesus so if the spirit that we're focused on isn't pointing us to jesus magnifying jesus exalting jesus reminding us about jesus it ain't the same spirit because this is his mo the Spirit bears witness about Jesus. John said, Jesus goes on to say in chapter 16, I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. To keep you from falling away. This word falling away in its original rendering is scandalizo. It's like scandal. It reminds you of the word scandal. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stumbling block that would cause you to trip and fall off the path when trouble comes the temptation is to turn because you fall over the uncertainty you fall over the lack of truth or the lie and Jesus says troubles here and troubles on the way I'm telling you the truth and the spirit of truth will come to keep you from falling away Verse two, he amplifies it. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. I'm certain that his words were putting the disciples in real time to the test because they're thinking this is what following Jesus will look like. Being put out of the synagogues, ultimately death. And they kept going. <clears throat> and they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. It's said earlier that they'll do them thinking that they're in the service of God. Why is the reason that trouble comes, persecution comes, even execution comes of the believer from the unbeliever? Because they don't know Jesus, they don't know the Lord. All the more reason for us to be passionate and zealous about sharing who he is. Jesus says in verse four, I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember I told them to you. Again, this here I am now, but remember this later dynamic. He's, he's giving them and equipping them and warning them for the future. I'll, continuing in verse four, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me and none of you asks me, where are you going? Now, interestingly, remember back in chapter 13, they were like immediately asking, where are you going? But this was when they first got the news. And I can't say for sure, but what it seems like from the text here is that verse six says, I've said these things to you and sorrow has filled your heart. At first it was shock. 
Ah, where are you going? Can I come? You're not leaving us, are you? But now that he unfolds more trouble to come and more realities of the future, he says, you're not asking me that anymore. Sorrow is invading your heart. Nevertheless, great word, verse 7, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. This is another mind blower, isn't it? It's to the disciples' advantage that Jesus goes away? Why? Because the Spirit comes to us. I think we lose sight of the fact that the come to you part is in the passage. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that encouraging? The Spirit comes to those who are in Christ and gives us advantage gives us advantage it's to our advantage that Jesus goes away because we've got this helper who is complete and right on time and right to the need coming to us and being in us verse 8 and when he comes one of his ministries, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Remember, the allusion to the world is most likely to the unbelieving world. So he doesn't indwell that wor- those folk. It says they, don't, they can't know him because they, they don't know him. They don't receive him because they can't know him. But he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And, and just pay, pay close attention to this, folks. The first is concerning sin because they do not believe in me. And I love how these tie together. The first ministry of the Spirit in conviction of the world is you don't believe God. You don't believe that Jesus is from God. Second, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. He's going to where perfection is. Because Jesus in himself, he is perfect, and his righteousness is complete. But we rely on our own righteousness, and the Old Testament refers to our righteous deeds, quote-unquote righteous deeds, as filthy rags, right? So when the Spirit convicts the unbeliever about righteousness, it is saying your righteousness, your attempts to to make right, to do right, to stand right before me are inadequate and incomplete and cannot save. And therefore, the third thing comes rushing in concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. We learned about it in Genesis 3 that the ruler, Satan of the world, will be crushed on his head And all who are in Satan, if I could borrow the phrase, who have rejected Jesus, who have not trusted Jesus as Savior, will be judged righteously and justly. So what an appeal I can make to you today. It's not my job, it's the Spirit's job. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But if it's pressing in on you today that sin is real, and separates you from God, and your righteousness in, an, in yourself is inadequate, but only the righteousness of Christ will save. And if you recognize that you will be judged according to these things, this is, I believe, the Spirit of God pressing in on you as I speak, because that's what he does. And I wanna encourage you to heed that as a call to come to the Lord and trust Jesus and stand in his righteousness because he completed the work. You don't have to complete any more work. He says it's finished. I came, I died in your place, took the penalty for your sin. I rose again. I live, and if you trust me, you may live also. Jesus says the fifth saying, or the fifth allusion to the Spirit in verses 12 through 15, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. A few more things the Spirit does 
is first guide you into all the truth. Guide you into all the truth. This is part of what he does. He guides into truth. He doesn't lead you astray. He doesn't give you false teaching. He guides into truth. Secondly, he speaks. This is the one that gets a little bit weird, right? The Spirit spoke to me. I've heard that, if I've heard that phrase once, I've heard it a million times. And oftentimes it's with either a literal or a figurative stiff arm out front, as if to say, you can't assail me and you can't challenge me because the Spirit told me so. So I usually don't try and engage in the battle there. But what I do try and say is, well, are, you willing, are we willing to kind of examine what the Word of God says? Because here's the deal, he speaks truth. And he magnifies Jesus. He guides into truth. And so if it's kind of personal feeling time, no offense, but I'm just not going to take it as serious from you. But if what you're telling me is that the, word, the Spirit has guided you into the truth of the Word, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears up. But indeed, I think sometimes in Bible churches, in conservative Bible churches like this one, we're afraid to say the Spirit speaks to us. He does speak. He's got a ministry. He speaks through his word and through truth, and he impresses things upon our hearts. He guides us. He speaks to us. And finally, one of the things he speaks to us is he declares to us the things that are to come. Now, this doesn't make us corners, uh, people who have the corner on the market of the future and can tell the future or anything like that. I think what it means is he will guide us in the path, in the truth, as we need to see what's coming. And he will direct us in the way, even things we don't know yet that, that are going to come. And finally, the last thing that this passage particularly says about what he does is he will glorify Jesus. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All the Father has is mine, therefore I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That, that connection between Father, Son, and Spirit. And in the doing of all that, Jesus gets glory. <clears throat> now he said a few more things that uh, he talked about a bunch of trouble, but he left them with three astounding comforts. First, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Isn't that comforting? Secondly, he says, Satan has no claim on me. I love that verse right there. Satan's got no claim on me. It's kind of got a legal allusion to it. He cannot prosecute me. He cannot win. The verdict is in already. He has no claim on me. And third, I've said these things to you that in me you have, may have peace. And then to get this, in the world you will have tribulation. Kind of a summary of all we've talked about, this interplay, peace, trouble. But listen to what Jesus says in the end of verse 33. Take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Let me just quickly summarize what we've seen in our marvelous passage today. The Spirit is a divine person, not a force, not some indefinable uh, mass or anything like that. He is, he is the member of the Godhead. Third, second, he is sent by the Father, God, and Jesus the Son. He proceeded from the Father. It's a typo that I added the word helper in. I think I was just loving the fact he's the helper so much that I wanted to put it in twice. He is our helper, the paraclete, Texas-style accent. The paraclete comes alongside, guides, comforts, directs, teaches, helps. He teaches, and he comes to us, <laughs> and he ministers to those who are uh, not in Christ, who have not trusted Jesus as Savior. He has a conviction ministry to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And to those who have trusted Jesus as Savior, he indwells. He was with you. He will be in you. And he advantages all who are in Christ. He guides into truth. He speaks. 
He declares things to come, and in the doing of all these things, he glorifies Jesus. That may be my second level script when I go into the next pain and loss situation. The first is those three points, and the second is, you want to know why? Because the Spirit is with you, and he's real, and the Father and Son have sent him to you, and he's your helper, and he's your teacher, and he's indwelling you, and you have an advantage that he has given you, and he's guiding you into truth, and he's speaking to you what is true, and he declares what you need for the future when you need it, and in all of that, glory be to Jesus. Now, I didn't forget one more. I wanted to add it at the end here, and this is jumping out of the book of John into the book of Ephesians. One last thing the Spirit does, and again, this isn't comprehensive. There are other places in Scripture, but I couldn't resist concluding this. In Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Now, I'm not, I haven't, had time to think about this between last night and this morning when I got the news about the passings but so I'm not I'm not I'm not going to say this with ironclad authority about sequentially how this works but here's what I do know that John and Helen and Neil are a whole lot closer to holding on to that inheritance today than we are (laughs) because their faith has now become sight Their faith has now become sight. They are in the rest of God. (sighs) At rest. Because the Spirit, when they believed Jesus, as it says here, the gospel, the word of truth, sealed them for eternity and guaranteed you are a child of the King and you have an eternal inheritance. He's the guarantee, the stamp, until you acquire possession of it. Come to Jesus today, would you? If you hear the Spirit convicting you, it could be that the Father is drawing you to trust Jesus alone as your Savior. I implore you to come to Jesus today. So are we applying this sermon in real time together as a family in Christ? What happens when we experience pain and loss and struggle? We keep going in faith by God's power. We respond to the work of the Holy Spirit and we glorify God by walking in his truth. Let's grab our connection cards as we conclude. On the back of your card, and you can click in on the QR code as well, you can find the connection card. And I want to just encourage every person in here to complete a connection card today. Add enough contact information on here so we can reach out and, and say hey. And especially if you've trusted Jesus as Savior or want to know what it means to trust Jesus as Savior, please let us know so we can contact you. But the first thing and these steps are the same pray with me that i will keep going in faith by the in the faith by god's power and folks this is a real personal one for me because days like weeks like this last week man it's stumbling block time isn't it falling away time temptation what's happening why keep going god is with you in you Second, well, and if you've trusted, if you've decided you want to trust Jesus as your Savior, begin a relationship with God in Christ, then put a check mark in the box right below the next steps for us, would you? And then next is respond to the work of the Holy Spirit. He speaks. What is he speaking today that's true? And respond and walk in his truth. And in the doing of that, we will glorify God. Let's take about a, a moment, to, a minute to, to fill these out together. And as the 
guys come here in a second to receive our offering. We can drop them in the, in the baskets. Thanks. As you're dropping your cards in the baskets, it's just uh, overwhelming to think about how much God loves us, isn't it? That he would send his son to die and rise again to pay the penalty for our sins and, and that he wouldn't leave us, as says in another place in scripture, as orphans, but he would send his spirit to be in us, that marvelous helper. All of that is, as I've said the, about the Upper Room Discourse, love in action. And it's because of the love of God that's been shed abroad in my heart that I'm able to love others. And the near, nearest term P folk I can say that to today is you. I love you. <laughs> Let's work this out together. Let's process this real time together. Love you. God bless you.